Welcome everyone, and today we're going to talk about Mao's tour because Hanukkah is approaching. Oh, okay, and, right. and the big question about Hanukkah, or the most famous song of Hanukkah, is certainly Mao's tour. And uh, it was censored. There's a lot of drama around this song. This let hymn. me guess. Let me guess. The Goyim censored it. Force the Jews to well, censor. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's not clear if we were afraid of the Goyim and we censored it, or they actually, or maybe both. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so I want to ask the following question: When was it written, and by who? What's the backstory of this poem? How did a sixth stanza pop up hundreds of years later? And where did the melody, the one that we're all familiar with, come from? So hey. by using the quotation marks, I'm alluding to the fact that there are other mel melodies out there. But there, this uh, one is really, is really the one that's most famous and popular across the Jewish world. Even though maybe we'll have time, we'll see a few others. So let's start with the poem itself. It's a piyut. It's a liturgical poem. It has six stanzas. Now, in many, in many shuls, in many sidur, they only print the first stanza. So, so a lot of people are only familiar with the first one, but there are actually six stanzas. And in my home, we always sing all six stanzas. So I know all of them by heart, thanks to my father, Alava Shalom. It was important for him that we sing all of them. The entire piyut that this person, Mordechai, wrote. And Mordechai lived in the 13th century in Germany during the time of the Second Crusade and uh, saw how much the Jews are suffering from the Crusades. And that affected his writing, affected this poem, this liturgical poem. Uh, but who was this Mordechai exactly? So first of all, how do we know that his name is Mordechai? Because if you look at the acrostic of, yes, the, yeah. of all the six stanzas, you will see that... Uh, is this, the first letter of each stanza is comes out for Mordechai. Mm. You see the screen with the whole the whole song. Yeah. Maos Sur Mem Reish Zaled Kaf Yud, and then the last stanza. Uh, what are the first three letters spelled? Hazak. Hazak. Very good. So this was a common custom among poets to end their song with Hazak. But who was Mordechai exactly? What do we know about him? Uh, the truth is, we know very little. And there are two theories out there about who he was. One theory is that he was Rabbi Mordechai ben Hillel, who lived from 1250 to 1298. And in the yeshiva world, maybe Niv, you can help us with this. He's known as the Mordechai. Have you heard that name while studying in the yeshiva? He he wrote um, a summary of halachot that come out from the sugyas of the shas, and uh, he's often quoted in the in the yeshiva world. Um, he was a rabbi in Nuremberg, Germany, and so maybe he also dabbled a little bit in in poetry and writing piyutim. And very sadly, he was actually murdered by the Crusaders. He and his whole family, his five children, were murdered by Crusaders. So that's one possibility that scholars today think that he might be the Mordechai that is signed uh, as an acrostic uh, on this poem. Another uh, theory that some scholars have put out there is that this is Mordechai Ben Yitzchak Halevi, who's actually Italian, born in Italy, but then moved to Mainz, Germany, or as it was called, Magensa. And he was actually a poet. There was a poet by the name of Mordechai. So it's either the Talmudist scholar, Mordechai, or maybe a poet, Mordechai. And, uh, but from the song itself, we can, we're can we going to see how much the atrocities that the Crusaders committed affected him. So now let's go to the first verse. And this is the verse that we're all familiar with. And we're all familiar with uh, a melody that's... Uh, Kind of solemn, I would say. Uh, right? Ma or so but you can actually put that melody uh and make it a little bit more energetic, as we'll see. So as as we uh watch the band called um mostly kosher, 
<laughs> mostly. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want you to think about the words and see which words. Uh, just try to try to think about the meaning of these words. So uh, I'm going to put both of them on, on your screen. So a little bit more upbeat than we're used to, huh? <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what is the meaning of the words? Um, so maybe many of you have uh, heard or read the famous English translation that appears in Shim Shalom, in websites, in our the Silverman Sitter, the Black Sitter. And it goes, have you seen this? Does this look familiar? Yes, yes. Rock of Ages yes. that our song praise your saving power. And mm -hmm. even that band sings it later in that in that clip. You are amidst the raging throng. Uh or maybe somebody can can read it for us. Any volunteer? Okay. Rock of Ages, let our song praise your saving power. You amidst the raging throng were our sheltering tower. Furious they assailed us, but your help availed us, and your word broke their sword when our own strength failed us. Okay. So I said this is a translation. I want to put yeah. both of them next to each other and tell me what, what's the problem? What, what problems do you see? If this is a translation, which again, it's, it's in our sitter, it's in Sim Shalom, it's, it's, what, what's the problem here? <clears throat> there are some words that are not translated properly. Oh, so this is a far cry from the Hebrew. I mean, Tzur, yeah, there's a rock there, and there's the Shabbat, right? Aleinu le Shabbat, I call it the praise. Mm -hmm. But in the Hebrew, I see Beit Filati. I see a house of prayer. I don't see that in English. What happened to that? Yeah. I see a Toda Nezabeach. Nezabeach, what's a Mizbeach? An altar. I don't see an altar in the English. Toda, now you might think that's thank you, but it's clear here that it's a Korban Toda. It's a offering a sacrifice called Toda. There was one of the sacrifices. There were different types of sacrifices. So I don't see anything about it offering a sacrifice here. It's almost like they deleted that whole thing. Then there's they assailed us. Okay, they, the enemies. I see Tsar. Tsar, you know, Tsaras. The, the enemies who do Tsaras to us, they're called Tsar in Hebrew. All right, so I see that, but what is Tachin Matbeach? I don't see the equivalent to that. And we're going to, that's that's the most enigmatic phrase here. What does that mean exactly? Um, mm -hmm. Your it's help availed us. Uh, I don't exactly see that. I don't see help in the Hebrew. Um, and your word broke their sword. I don't see any sword. I don't see cherev. Uh, I don't see like your word. But I do see in the Hebrew that I will ignore, I will finish, conclude, Bashir Mizmor in a, in a song, in a poem. Oh, and there's no, no Mizbeach again. Like it's like they mm -hmm. omitted totally. Like no Mizbeach, no dedication of the Mizbeach. So what's going on here? This this hardly seems like a translation. And so here's the truth of the, of the of the matter. This is really not a translation. This is a different song altogether. This is really an adaptation written by uh, two scholars that were very important. Oh, I wanted to say that uh, my father, Rav Shalom, used to say when we claim that something is similar to something else, but then when he asked us for details. It turned out that it's not similar at all. He would say, this is like the famous quote that appears, you know, in books and movies. Any resemblance to the real person is living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> so I was reminded of that when I said, when I looked at the translation that is printed in many sidurim and then looked at the Hebrew, like there is no, there is no similarity here. This is, if you think this is Mount Sur, that's purely coincidental. So that's just on the humor side. But really, where did it come from, right? So, so this, this is a poem written by somebody and this was written by two very serious uh, scholars 
from the 19th century. Marcus Jastrow and Gustav Guthel, very important uh, rabbis, and Jastrow is famous in the yeshiva world. Why, uh, Niv? Is Niv with us? Are you, are you on he wrote a dictionary, a Aramaic English dictionary. Ah, yeah, I can, yeah, I can show it. I can bring a copy. Yes. Oh, you're going to show us a copy. Okay. Uh, great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, already in my day in the yeshiva, they used it. I mean, not already. They, they to, to this day, I remember it from my days in the yeshiva, and, and now you're using it. So very important, uh, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, yeah sure. Oh, okay. Maybe I, I have to see it. Now show. Ask your Christian friend. Ask your Christian friend. Yeah. Oh, Can you see you it? Yeah. Now we see it. Yeah. So that's Joshua. Here's the Joshua. So he's responsible for this poem, which was really an adaptation of a German version by Leopold Stein, an early important rabbi in the Reform movement. They decided they want different words, and so they wrote something. They never claimed this mouse tour. They they wanted it to fit the melody. That's perfectly fine. But they wrote their own piyut. In, in other words, they basically continued the tradition of writing piyutim, but wrote a different piyut. Okay? And to claim that this is a translation, that's very problematic. And that just shows you now, I want to show you, for example, this is why you can't trust things that you see on the internet. I'll show you now um, a reputable website, myjewishlearning.com. And let me share my screen. You got to be careful. Anything that you read in books or on the, or on, and certainly on the internet. I use them all the time. I love this website. I, when I need to explain to my students cultural stuff, Shabbat Shabbat, Tzitzit, Mezuzat, Filin, I use this website. It's great. But when you go to Mao's tour, they explain a little bit. We're going to get into that. And they put, here's the English, and then here's the Hebrew. Mao's tour, Shwati, and okay. It's not. They could have said, this is a different song that is often sung to the same melody, but it's totally not the translation of Mao's tour, right? But they didn't say that. And now it's misleading. Uh, and and same thing with Sim Shalom, same thing with our Silverman Theater. So nothing wrong with writing another song and but letting everybody know it's another song, uh, as as Marcus Jastrow and and Gustav Guthal did in the 19th century. So we need to go to more serious translations in order to to understand the words. So let's let's check out now. Um, one second, I think. I'm not showing the right screen. Okay. So, Professor Yitzhak Malamed, who teaches at Johns Hopkins University, has written many books and articles. Professor of uh, philosophy and Talmud. Um, he's going to provide us. We're going to use his translation. So, Mao Suri Shwati. And what's nice about this poem is that, or what's difficult about it, actually, He's that there's a lot of allusions to phrases in Tanakh, to images in Tanakh, to Talmudic uh, statements, to Midrashim. And that's what these Paitanim, these people who wrote Piyotim, did a lot, which makes it, on one hand, hard to understand, but it's like a challenge. And we're going to be up for the challenge. So, Maoz Suri Shoti is based on phrases in Tanakh talking about God, who is the rock of my salvation. To you, it's proper to Leshabeach. Uh, Tikon beitefilati, prepare the house of my prayers. Visham toda nezabeach, and there I will offer the korban toda, the thanksgiving offerings. I'm skipping now the third stand, the third part. Leetachin matbeach. I want to go to the end. Azik mol b'shir mizmol chanukat mizbeach. Then I shall conclude with a psalm song for the inauguration of the altar. Now, now that's a translation. And of course, you can substitute a gmol to finish. Um, there's no right and wrong, but now let's go to the problematic one, the one that's causing a lot of controversy. And that is, So if we tried by ourselves to translate it, in the time, et with iron is the time. In the time that you will prepare a matbeach from the enemy who is menabeach. What will you prepare for the enemy? What do you think? What's a, it's a uh, slaughter. Oh, excellent. So Mel At is Be'ah. referring us to a, a word, and this is what Professor Malam had translated it. So a similar word, when you prepare a butchery for the barking enemy. Now, how did Mel get to that? How did Professor Malam get to that? 
So we look in the Bible. What is the root of the root of the of teva? It is indeed slaughter. And to prove that to you, I'll bring you two verses. In Parshat Miketz, a week from now, we're going to read that Joseph said to his steward on the house, the one in charge, the, the, the chief um, cook, slaughter some slaughter animals and prepare them. So, tvach tevach ve'achen. And this is from the translation of Professor Fox, who likes to keep the Hebrew sing song, the, the Hebrew uh, play on words. You see, tvach tevach, so he likes to do that in English. So I like what he did here. You could just translate it, slaughter some animals, slaughter some food, but he tries to keep the roots also in the English. So, and then more to the point, in Isaiah, there is a verse, Achinu levanav matzbeach, about uh, the Babylonians, that they're going to be punished for what they did to the nation of Israel, for the for conquering Israel and exiling them. Isaiah prophesizes, prepare a slaughtering block for his sons. And maybe this is the one that influenced him, or he's he's drawing upon this verse, and he's saying, prepare God a a slaughter block for our enemies. And uh, so, what other in modern Hebrew, we have several words that come from this root that have now been sanitized, so to speak. They are now positive words, like what you see in the picture. Midbah. Right? So I always say, if somebody has a vegetarian kitchen, maybe they should try to start using a different word. Because it, would, it would be like saying, my slaughterhouse vegetarian kitchen. <laughs> my room. My slaughterhouse room, which is vegetarian. Okay? But again, no, it's fine. Because now it takes on a new meaning. With any kitchen, any place where you prepare food, no matter if you're slaughtering animals or not, is now a mitbah. Another word? Tabach. Again, you can be a tabach who only is vegetarian and only... Uh, doesn't doesn't deal with uh, animals, uh, and still you'll be a tabach. There are two negative connotations to this root. Tevach is the modern Hebrew word for massacre. We speak about the tebach v'sabo v'shatira. That was in the, during the Lebanon War, the Sabra and Shatira massacre. All the all the headlines in the newspapers screamed tevach. And then we have Beit mitbachaim, which makes sense. House of slaughter, where they slaughter the animals. So, in modern Hebrew, there's both good meanings, what I call the, the positive meanings, mitbach, tabach, and then also the more gory uh, meaning uh, words that derive from this. But in the Bible, it's slaughter. And so now we get to the, oh, and there's matbucha. <laughs> which, yeah, oh uh, yeah. Who doesn't like matbucha? Well, actually, I don't like it so much, but... It's from the Arabic. In the Arabic, that is, you know, so many roots are similar between Hebrew and Arabic. It's fascinating. I wish they, they would just get along better. But they, in terms of languages, they, they really they draw from each other all the time. And so in, in the Arabic language, that root, tavach, is cook. So it's because of the cooked peppers and, and tomatoes. It actually doesn't have any meat. It doesn't have meat. But because of the, they're, they're, you know, they're cooked and then they add all these spices and onions, that's why it's called matbucha. So it's from the Arabic. Very similar to the Hebrew. So we're back to our song. So why why are we preparing a slaughter to the enemy? So uh, this, this line uh, is because of he himself and his family and his community were being slaughtered by the crusaders. So he's not even asking for to slaughter some nation or some community, but God, save us from these slaughterers. Slaughter them. This is very understandable. He, he, he doesn't say slaughter their communities. He just says, So this is what? This is a different translation. Blaspheming foe. Uh, this is Rabbi Korn. Uh, no, this is somebody else. Uh, the Or another one was barking enemy. So just the enemy. So this is no way what we would call today a massacre or a slaughter. But this is the word that he used, perhaps because he saw how much suffering the Jews were suffering at the hands of these Christians. All in the in name. The art scroll, my the art scroll uses blaspheming. Oh, art scroll, right? Yeah, yeah. This art is, scroll is a oh, blasphemy. Oh, yeah, so. uh, yeah. And but now I want to show you how even great scholars were hesitant to translate this line. Even <laughs> Rabbi. Uh, okay, so we talked about it. He's he's praying for divine revenge. 
for the blood of tens of thousands, some say even hundreds of thousands of Jews, murdered by the Crusaders, all in the name of Christian love. And But today, when they print the Sidur, let's see what Rabbi Sachs did in his Sidur. Look what he did. This is from Rabbi Sachs's Koran Siddur. Do you see what he did? Mm -hmm. So as a translator, mother, what do you think about that? It's a dilemma. So I think he did it because he was afraid it's going to be fodder for the anti-Semites. They're going to say Jews are praying for slaughtering the non-Jews. He's a scholar. He knows very well Matbech means slaughter, butchery. But he's also a very well-known, renowned world le Jewish leader. Right? And so he's in a dilemma. So what do you do? What do you do? You, are you loyal to the author? Are you taking into consideration political considerations? What do you do? So if I had the chance to ask him, you always have you always want to ask questions to people who are no longer with us, sadly. Uh, he, he would probably say, you know, I have to think about all my non-Jewish friends and, and what they would say, and this is going to be used by Jews all over and maybe misunderstood. But here's what I would, here's my rebuttal, or here's what I would ask him. Um, isn't it important to teach people what they did to us? And isn't that part of his legacy? He didn't just write a poem so that we could sing and have fun like uh, that mostly kosher band. He wanted to memorialize all the tens of thousands who were slaughtered by Christians. And by whitewashing it, but like you wouldn't say this about the Nazis. You wouldn't say the Nazis silent us. That was a mini Holocaust. And to, and to come and to say, oh, this is a silencing, this is some other verb, I, I have a problem with that. And I think- well you know, Sham, I, I think the word blasphemer is probably even more difficult and for, for Rabbi Sachs as well uh, than, than the idea of slaughter, because in the 20, 20th and 21st centuries, we have come around to the idea that Christians aren't blasphemers and they are monotheists, which was always a difficult uh, point for us right right so you could you could say um the barking enemy Novech, we talk about dogs that bark and i think he used that uh that verb here Minabech, uh, again to uh, denigrate them the enemies yes they, they are like dogs who are barking at us and um so i i, I see why he changed it to loud mouth uh yeah, shall I? yeah. Yeah, well, I'd like to say something. This is not the first instance where we had to change text because of uh, external threats or implications. Uh, uh, Lena was 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 also changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We yeah. we don't say, and you look in our sitters, we don't say those certain right. lines. Right. Right. But was, you can always add explanations, commentaries. In fact, I mean, I have a sitter right here and I use it a lot. And he's, he writes very interesting commentaries. You could write a commentary, a note and say the reason he used the word slaughter is because his communities were slaughtered and tens of thousands of Jews were murdered by Christian crusaders. Today, happily, the, the relationships are much better. He can write all that. And, and that's why I think it's important for the legacy, for the, to remember those people who died at the hands of Christians. It's, all, it's not all nice and dandy. Christian Hanukkah, Christmas Hanukkah, everybody's happy, everybody goes shopping. Yeah, today. But we have to remember what they did to us. And that's part of why why he wrote it, why he wrote the poem. Uh, and and um, so I support, in this case, the OU. They they had no problems, right? We saw it. When you I have to tell you, it, it also reminds me unfortunately, of the fact that there were turncoat Jews who took these these words and showed them to the Christians, although there were, there were Christians who were literate in Hebrew, but there were Jews who sold their people right. out. That, that's true. That's very true. So they had to be aware of that, too. So that explains now the next part. We're going to quickly go to the next part. Um, the next four stanzas... They were included all these years. They were they ne were never omitted. They weren't censored. They what do they do? They survey miraculous redemptions in Jewish history. So the first one, quickly scan it and tell me without seeing the English first, which redemption is this about? Pick out the key words. My life was embittered. Sounds like bitter herbs or pesach. Oh, excellent. So and then you see paro here in the in the bottom. Okay, so the second stand-up is about the enslavement in Egypt. 
you can read it yourself, and how God delivered us from the hands of the Egyptians, and they eventually, um, oh, I don't know why I didn't translate, I somehow got, oh, there it is, sank like a stone into the deep, yeah, the, the Red Sea, okay. Then he goes, oh, I don't know why, I already gave you the English, okay, so um, he brought me to his holy abode, but there too I had no rest. And an oppressor came and exiled me because I had served strange gods. I had drunk poison wine. I almost perished. Then Babylon fell. Zerubbabel came. Within 70 years, I was saved. So Zerubbabel allowing them to go back to the land of Israel. Right. Yes, so this yes. is the, ba the Babylonian exile. So right. we, were, we were exiled and then we were delivered. Okay. Then he has he goes to another miraculous redemption. Which one uh -huh. is this? Poor, poor, poor. Right. So, and there are allusions here to Midrashim, like Mordechai is not named, but instead uh, the tall fir tree. That is a Midrash that calls uh, Mordechai by that. So this 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 rabbi was very well versed in Midrash and in Tanakh. Uh, and then Rosh Yemini, the Benjaminite, the guy from the tribe of Benjamin. Again, a reference to to Mordechai. And uh, you blotted out the name of the enemy and his sons and his household were hanged on the gallows. And then finally, he comes to the fifth the fifth stanza, the final redemption he talks about, is the one of Hanukkah. Then the Greeks gathered against me in the days of the Hasmoneans, or maybe it's important people, it's not clear what this word is. They broke down the walls of my towers and defiled all the oils. But from the last remaining flask, a miracle was wrought to your beloved, Therefore, the sages ordain these eight days for song and praise. So this was the end of the song for centuries, from the 13th century all the way to the end, 8th, 18th century. Then, lo and behold, a sixth stanza pops up. First wow. time it appeared was in Amsterdam in 1702. So, Immediately, the question is, maybe add some, it was added by somebody else. And that's what, if you guys uh, grew up in Berenboim, remember that sitter, the Berenboim sitter? He says yeah. that when he brings Mao's tour, before the last, the sixth stanza, he says, added much, much later. However, most scholars today think that it was deleted. It was not written down, never, because they were so afraid of the Goim and censored for centuries and just passed on orally orally they think that because it's in the same structure let's look at it let's look at the sixth stanza the one that had chazak remember that started with chazak so it talks about avenging the blood of your servants it talks about a uh, wicked nation and then it talks about, for the redemption has been long delayed and there's no end to the days of misery. Reject Edom in the shadow of the image and raise up for us the seven shepherds. It's built in the same structure as the other paragraphs. That's one reason they think it's the same. But historically, Edom was uh, used as a euphemism for Christianity. Oh, for excellent. We're going to get to that. Another oh. reason is, why would you end the poem with the deliverance of the Maccabees when you're suffering so greatly, like it makes, it doesn't make sense. You're, you're praying to God, God save us from these terrible crusaders. That should be the end, right? Now it makes sense that uh, just as you did in the past four stanzas, I spoke about Egypt, I spoke about Babylon, I spoke about Purim, I spoke about the Maccabees. Please do that for us. We're suffering at the hands of this wicked nation. So it all comes together. The first one was prepare a slaughter for our enemy because they're, they're terrifying us, they're killing us. We want the, the, the Beit HaMikdash to be rebuilt and to sing and praise and not to have to have any violence. And it ends with that same prayer. So it all seems like one whole unit. And so that's why most today's scholars, now again, if you go to um, that website that I showed you beforehand, um, what was the website that I told you about? They have the my Jewish learning. My yeah, Jewish, my Jewish learning. learning. Again, they're going to say that this was added many centuries later. But most scholars think it wasn't. It was, this is what part of the original song. Now let's talk about the words, the actual words. And let's see a very interesting theory by Professor Malamed. He says the Karev Ketza Yeshua 
Yeah, the simple meaning might be bring the end of redemption, Yeshua. The problem with that is, and, and I checked it on, uh, on the online concordance, there's nowhere in the Bible this phrase, Ketz HaYeshua. Jesus? Like we know, we know he, right? Maybe there's Yom There's never together. This might not be what we think. This might have a surreptitious meaning to it. Uh-huh. How do we say Jesus yes. in Hebrew? Yeah, there it Yeshua. is. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The old, in the New Testament, it's yeah. all Yeshua, yeah. Yeshua, Yeshua. Yeah. He might be saying, bring the end of Jesus' season. He adds a hey because hey makes it into a noun. When you add a hey to a Hebrew uh, word. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this might be the undercover meaning. And no wonder they hit it. No wonder they hit it. Exactly. <laughs> so even though it's only hinted, it's so, it's so, it could be spell so much trouble for the Jews, they couldn't, they couldn't bring themselves to to set to, to publish it. So that's one very interesting theory. Then he says, uh, Bill pointed this out: avenge the blood of your servants from the wicked nation. Who is that wicked nation? That's standard rabbinic reference to Rome and Christianity. Yeah. So again, it's a little bit uh, covert, but really what he's meaning is that what the Christians are doing to us. And then the final two lines, and we're going to end with this, is very, very interesting. He says, There were two variants here, whether to say Ro'e or Ro'im. So Admon, Edom, that's standard rabbinic reference to Christianity. So reject Edom, reject Christianity, who are, oh, and there's another theory. There was a crusader leader, Frederick Barbarossa. His name yeah. means the red bearded. So maybe that's the Edmond. And I looked up on his website. Uh, I looked up on Wikipedia. He's this great Holy Roman emperor. He's a great hero. Nothing about all the Jews he massacred. That's why I think it's so important to tell it like it is and not to beat around the bush. We need to tell the world what they did. You, if you read that that entry in Wikipedia, oh, he's a nice guy. He's he's a hero. He's a military, uh, you know, great guy militarily. But not a word, not a word about tens of thousands of people who massacred. Not to mention the Muslims he massacred. So, so it, it is important to talk about what they did. All right. So maybe it's him. I don't think so. I, I don't think the author knew about the red bearded. I think it's more Edo. That's my my feeling. But now let's talk about the. Oh, that's a picture of him. What's the Salmon? So Professor Malamed says it's a polysemic. Selim in the Bible is an image or an idol. We all are familiar with the word, but Selim Elohim Barauto. Man was created in the in his image. In the image of God. And later in the Bible, in Kings, uh, the, the, they came into the uh, place where the Baal, where there were all the idols for the Baals, and they and they smashed them. So Tslamav, you see, this is a verse from Kings, from Melachim. But maybe it also a reference to the cross, because in Eastern European, in Eastern Europe, they called the cross in Hebrew Tselem. Yes. And there is actually a town in Hungary called Deutschkreuz, which in Hebrew was referred to as Tselem, which means German cross, right? If you take the two words. In Yiddish, yes. In Yiddish, a cross is a Tselem. Oh yes. So, and that comes from the from the Hebrew. They took it from the Hebrew, and the rabbi of that. And that community was called the Tselemrov, which is a, <laughs> a bit, <laughs> uh, which is a kind of ironic. So again, a multi-layered word with an undercurrent talking about the cross. So uh, this might be the meaning of that sentence: reject Christianity as one that stands in the shadow, but still the idol cross. That's what he's talking about. Well, that's strong words, idol cross. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. accusing yeah. the Christians of being uh, idol worshippers. Well, that, he's using a word that can mean idol and cross, right? right. He, that's why he's using that word. So th this is Baird, uh, Professor Malaman's translation. That's uh, or, dangerous. That's yeah, dangerous. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So that explains why they had to hide this. This uh, In, in uh, Rabbi Sachs's translation, um, and in the OU, they don't say, they just say, uh, shadows of death. Ah, also, yeah, they say even yeah, they yeah. dodge the issue too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so. they kind of also yeah, yeah. But I like Professor Malam's analysis here, lo looking at the root, looking at the word Selim, seeing what it means in other places, and 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 also showing us that he might have meant several things here. Okay, and that's the final two lines, and then the final line. Hakem lanu shiva. What does that mean? 
And there was another variant, Hakem Lanu Ro'eshira. What's the difference between the two? One, one is singular, one is uh, plural. Right. So um, the, it's either oh, seven shepherds, that's the first one, right, in plural, like Mel says, or if it's singular, then obviously one shepherd cannot be seven, then the seven is not a modifier, it's not a number that modifies shepherd, it's shepherd of the seven, right? Like Beit Knesset, house of gathering. You don't need to put a word in between the two words in Hebrew. So what's the difference between these two readings? So Professor Mallet says that he did an unsystematic survey. He thinks that the second one is the more frequent, although in the Koran Center, Berenbaum, uh, in, in the one is Royim, the one that my father gave me, Allah Shalom, it has the second one, has Ro'eshiva. I looked at it tonight. So if it's Ro'im, if it's plural, this is a reference to a, a verse in the book of Micah. Ashur ki avo be'artzenu, v'akimonu alav shiva Ro'im, u'shmona nesichei adam. Should Ashur, Assyria, invade our land, we will set up over it seven shepherds and eight princes of men. So if they invade us, we will be victorious, we will have these leaders. And he calls them by different names. Once it's seven shepherds, once it's eight princes. That's one option. And now, did this prophecy already happen? So there was a, a commentator called Rid from the uh, 13th century, Rabia Azia di Tirani from Italy, who said, who are these seven shepherds? These are the ministers of King Hizkiah. So if we take Rid's explanation, did this prophecy already happen? When, when Micha is, is prophesizing about this. It is, yes. Yes, right. Because it's in his days. The, the times of Hizkiah and the prophet Micah are about the same 6th century BCE. So that's according to him. But many understand it. Oh, and this would, this would build upon a statement in the Talmud by Rabbi Hila II that don't talk, me, don't talk about Moshiach that will come. No, it already came and that's it. There's no more. I like that idea. My grandfather loved that idea. He said Mashiach is always an idea that is will be in the future. It never actually happens in reality. And he could base it on this Talmudic statement that there is no Messiah to Israel as he was already consumed at the time of King Hezekiah. Basically he's saying, because Messianism is very dangerous. Some people allow themselves to do you know, acts of violence in the name of, oh, this is times of Messianism. So uh, Rabbi Hila says, Don't, there's, no, there's not going to be the future. It's already happened. So that's one option. The other option, uh, and then another, and then Rabbi Joseph Ibn Kaspi from the 14th century said that, that those seven shepherds in the prophecy of Micah, that's the Maccabees. Look what he says. Matityahu mm -hmm. and his five sons, together with them, there were Jewish elders and warriors, for many joined them. This is why it says seven and eight, meaning very many. So according to Rabbi Joseph Ibn Kaspi, did the prophecy already happen? Yeah, because yes. it was during Matityahu. It's during the Maccabees. So it's already done. Do you think but, he was, was he influenced by by Mao Sewell to write that that comment on the Royim Shiva? Oh I don't think I don't think, yeah, that's an interesting question. Maybe it was ah, very good, very good. Maybe that influenced the right because because it, it had already been available, probably because he lives in the 14th century. Wow, oh, very interesting. Very, very interesting thought. Maybe that influenced him. He doesn't say that though. Okay, um, so that's. Um, but most uh, people understand that verse to mean this will be the redemption time, the geula. Now, Rabbi, Professor Malam has said there is another variant that where we read a singular or eshiva, shepherd of the seven. So I'm showing you one of the classic verses of Jewish eschatology, the Jewish messianism in Isaiah. It's very famous. The wolf. Now count and tell me how many animals do you see in this verse? Six. Six. Seven. 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 I see Seven. wolf, lamb, leopard, kid, calf, lion, fatling. And oh. then the child is leading them, is hurting them. So maybe, says Professor Malamed, that's the reference here. It's to bring us the messianic era where there will be this brotherhood, universal peace and brotherhood, that even these animals, these seven animals, will be led by one, one leader, one little, here it's a little child, he doesn't, he calls him a ro'e, 
but but that's what the child is doing. He's hurting them. He's he's right. He's he's a lawyer, really. He's a shepherd. Very interesting thought. Um, not sure it's really the real meaning because the verb here, the verb in Maus Tzur is hakem lanu, and that verb goes back to the other verse that we saw from Micah. So if you want to talk about verb and roim and shepherds, raise to us the shepherds. You see, that's strictly from the Micah verse about the she seven shepherds and the eight princes. But it's still a very interesting thought uh, that maybe this is um, a messianic era where there will be this universal peace, and that's what we're praying for. So sorry to take your time. Uh, any questions? Can you show that line again about uh, the uh, shadow of the image. Yes. So the the line in Hebrew reads, admon salmon." So reject admon in the shadow of salmon. Okay. So I, I didn't translate the problematic, the questionable words, but this "dche" is reject. That's very clear, and "mitzel" is shadow. So reject the Admon who is in the shadow in the shadow of Salmon. And, okay. and if we understand Admon as a reference to Christianity and um, Salmon as a reference to cross or idol or image, then says Professor Malamed, this is that somehow that what that would mean. So, this is what the intended meaning of. That, that picture, you know, what immediately came to my mind was not that relatively innocuous cross, but the, you know, in every church in the medieval era, and even now, uh, the Catholic church, Catholic there's church. like a 10, 10, foot, a 10 foot high, you know, the guy who's hanging. It's not, that's the idol. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. That could be the Salmon. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Very interesting. So we need to write more commentaries, including Natalie's commentary on this yes. on this <laughs> enigmatic verse. Very enigmatic. But in this in this environment of anti-Semitism, I wouldn't want Natalie to have yeah. her name on that. You're uh, right. Take so, it away. So, so um, yeah, but uh, I mean, still, he's he's only saying this. You have to understand the background of when he wrote it and what he saw around him. And I think that provides context. And it's always important to see context of poems or writings or commentaries uh, because that can help us uh, understand it. And um, so there, thank you for, for your time. Yashakoa, Yashakoa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shemai. Thank you. Thank you.